Welcome to Carolina Sculpture Studio. My name's Clint Button, and I'm a granite sculptor. Welcome to video number 45 of the virtual stone carving apprenticeship. All right, we've uh, had some other work come along. Like I said, I'm doing this apprenticeship series in real time. This is the way the world really works. Uh, you don't always get to get one project, and then you don't even think or talk about anything for months until the next project comes along. You just work on that one project, and you get to focus. Uh, you have to juggle a number of different projects and stages all along the way while you're bidding work and trying to get other commissions and sell other jobs and deliver stuff and have it installed and all that. So I um, was able to do a couple other projects, post them on, you know, videos. Some I did, uh, I did some panel work and and uh, did one with, um, with the cross, that abundant cross. Uh, that I did include in the apprenticeship series, and then there was a uh, bird bath and some other stuff that I haven't included uh, because I I just didn't think it was relevant at this point. So um, back to clay. Uh, this has been a, a good break. Uh, I've been able to critique my work while I'm looking at something else and get away from it. It's hard to see things when all you have to look at is one project. You get very blind on your project. And if you don't have other people working with you in studio, uh, things get ugly and they stay ugly. They don't go, oh, you're not going to leave it like that, are you? Because she needs help or that's crooked or whatever. So um, I did a little bit of changing with this. Um, I, I wasn't happy with the posture of the head like I had it before. Um, I just didn't feel like I could get it to look as natural and as comfortable as I wanted to. So I changed a little bit. And uh, I'm also going to amend this die because we're running into, I'm gonna to have to do a tremendous amount of digging here and I don't wanna to have to dig an eight inch deep flat face that's in such an awkward position because that's gonna mean a tremendous amount of digging down here to have a panel that you've gotta true up and because the light will shine down, it'll show any irregularities here, it'll, they'll just jump right out and it'll look like crap. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to try to amend this die to have it flare a little bit. And that goes back to some of the things I've talked about, you know, mimic and repetition and parallel lines and everything. We've got some good sway going here as I change this drapery. And we'll end up having this flare out a little bit and probably put a little foot on it. We've got to juggle with the size of this die. Um, that's, this is very convertible during the project. She's the focal point. So, um, so we're going to do that, but before I do that, I'm going to move the camera. I want to show you some of the books that I use in terms of referencing for drapery because there's, there's ways to do drapery uh, that are, there's different perspectives. And so I want to I show you what I use and what I reference, and uh, it may help you in how you put things together. So let's move the camera and see if we can get this underway hopefully you'll be able to see this okay i'll put a list of these books uh in the in the description so you can look them up um the the standard book that i was trained with when we when we were when i was in my apprenticeship with gary's is the uh ecclesiastical art inspirations uh by the a de Prado Company, okay? There's, this is initial A, and then D-A, and then Prado, P-R-A-T-O, company out of Boston, Massachusetts. Now, that's different. My understanding is a different company than the de Prado Statuary Company out of Chicago, okay? The A de Prado is a horizontal book, as a vertical book, and the De Prado Statuary Company is a horizontal book. They're both very, very similar. Uh, they're both approved by it. This is actually one that was used in Elberton for, for decades before I got it. Um, yeah, you can see it says A De Prado Company. And this is a small, you know, mailer that you used to get out of Boston. Uh, they're um, approved by the, by the Vatican. They got an official seal where they approve them as appropriate for, for Catholic churches and everything. This is a book of mostly plaster statuary. 
And what this has, this has all the Catholic icons that you could think of that were relevant, that uh, were current enough back in, uh, I think this is back in 19, I forget, 1919, I don't remember um, and if it even has a date in this. Yeah, 1929. So anyone that was new, you know, canonized, brought in, wouldn't be in this. But this has just an endless amount of statuary images. Um, the the DePrado Statuary Company book um, has equitable content. I mean, I, I don't know that one's really any better than the other. They're just, there's minor, minor variations. And if you know the icons well enough and you know what they offered, you may recognize one as a DePrado versus an A DePrado. Um, but you've really got to be well versed. They also have um, now a lot of this drapery in here is is plaster. You know, it's they're plaster models. So what you can do in plaster is just basically what you can do in clay, and that's great. Um, they've also got a section towards the back with marble sculpture, where they've actually got marble bas relief and full round pieces. Um, they do have. And there's some full, full, full round standing statues. They also have um, some bronze offerings. But what this will do is this gives you a lot of comparison pieces to look at in terms of drapery and also in terms of wings. Now their wings aren't as ornate as what like uh, Saint Godin's and some of the other um, Beaux Arts people did, uh, or uh, uh, how the different pieces were interpreted. Um, but uh, um, it's it's to have one of these books is really really valuable. Um, I've got uh, a Caproni catalog. This is a Caproni cast, and this is also out of I believe out of Boston. Um, and see, this is uh, this the price list was updated. This is a 1911 catalog, and. The price list was updated in 1932. This is more of a dictionary or an encyclopedia of all kinds of classical pieces. There's a lot of fragments. There's a lot of ancient works. There's, uh, you know, they got Michelangelo and, and, and uh, uh, Rossellini and different, different, you know, celebrated artists and sculptors. Um, Greek, Roman, everything. Um, and it, it isn't as good for drapery per se, but it gives you a lot of ideas on what's out there in terms of posture, composition, how things were done. And these were, uh, you know, if you buy a, um, if, if you've got like an ear of David, you know, it's pretty common to see the ear of David for a, a model. That would originally come from a company like the, like Caproni. Um, and so there's a lot in here that you can reference to, uh, to study for images. I've got quite a few Michelangelo books um, because he is the end of the ruler. He's the master. Uh, I think my favorite one and my favorite piece is the Pieta. And this is a book that was produced. I've carved several jobs out of this book. Um, and it's just phenomenal what it shows for drapery. Uh, this was before that guy went and smashed it with a hammer and they put it back behind where you couldn't get to it. Um, tremendous amount of information in this book. It's just pictures um, and it's really, really wonderful. So um, they've got an overhead view of the Pieta, which you generally never see. You know, the Christ face in repose, you never see that. Um, so uh, there's... Uh, it's it's just a really great reference, um, and I use this as much or more than any of the other. I've got several Michelangelo um, books, but this is my favorite. Um, another catalog, uh, this is an old Towner catalog, a little more current, and this was something that was more typical through, uh, they worked through Elberton, Georgia, and uh, they're... Uh, they had all types of marble statuary, large and small, that you could get. And uh, it's my understanding that this is a later catalog that they used to have more content that had been um, removed. Um, it, you know, whether that's true or not, nobody's been able to refute it. 
That's why it's not a full book because you usually have full pages like that. Um, but a uh, lot of good drapery in here. Uh, and it's a good way to, if you're in the memorial industry, you may come across some of the statuary that's been in the cemetery for decades and it's all worn out or it was copied poorly. And so you can look at this and say, okay, yeah, that's a St. Anthony with child. And this is what it should have had because the flowers are gone and part of the book is broken or his head's missing or whatever. Um, and so once again, these these industry catalogs are, are indispensable. And if you're gonna do drapery and you want your product to look like it belongs in that venue of a cemetery, this is a good place to to uh, find reference. Now, in terms of art, one of the few books I found on actual drapery is this one by George Bridgman from back in, uh, I think, 42, 43, something like that. This is a Dover reprint. Dover's got tons and tons of great stuff. If you haven't been through the Dover library or catalog, you really should. You'll find a lot of content there. Um, that hasn't been reinterpreted endlessly. It's work that was more, there's some that's original. I got one the other day, uh, just at the thrift store that was a reprint of a book from 1630 or something on with a whole bunch of, of banding and diapers. It was really cool. That was a Dover print. Um, this has discussions of the various, and this is another Goodwill book. Um, this has a discussions of the seven laws of folds as this author puts it now this has relevance towards what we're doing in stone but you got to understand this is really quick and simple put a few lines on there draw a few lines just to sort of mimic that that's a contour and not a flat surface and your mind is automatically going to fill in the blanks because you understand this is supposed to be probably a female form and not a male form and this is supposed to be drapery on there because she's not naked and your mind will automatically fill in the rest and say well that's probably clothes because she's not wearing a tree or a hamburger that's probably fabric and so your mind will fill in a lot of this and this is one of the problems when you work with renderings alone is it's real quick to just draw a few quick sketches and scribble a little bit and make it look very dramatic. The problem is, is that if somebody sends me a drawing of just say, for instance, this pipe, this fold right here, I got to figure out what that is in three dimensions. And that doesn't tell me, that doesn't tell me much at all. So these are, these are a good tool to help you learn. You know, this is easier to decipher um, but even in this old work like this, it's very easy to wrinkle this up. And if you've got extra material, you can make it disappear. And if you need more material, you can just add in a few extra lines when you end up realizing that if you did the math of this line right here versus the same line over here, this line may be another foot longer than this. And it wouldn't make sense in real life. You don't have that much material because that would swallow up this material. So learn learn about it and practice study your books you know same thing here that's really great that's a real quick wondering but if somebody sent me that and i had to carve it i'd have to fill in all kinds of information that's not there because that simply is not feasible to just carve like it is you have to change it into three dimensions so um once again i'll put these all in the in the um description so you can look them up find what you want and, uh, but realize that it's real quick and easy to do a quick rendering. Take just a couple of minutes, if you're good, to do a really nice, get all the gesture you want and have everybody understand what you're, what you're producing and what you're trying to communicate. But changing that into stone is a whole different ball of wax. So let's look at this clay a little bit and show you what I've done so far. I do get on the internet and look, and you can find images from cemeteries around the world now. Uh, if you dig deep enough to get past all the Chinese junk that's online when you type in cemetery, statue, or whatever, 
Um, there's, there's really nice work out there if you know where to look. And so all these, and then you can get pictures of, of actual people, you know, live people. And oh, this is all clipped up. I can't really just show you everything. I've got some pictures out of the Deprado, so it's easier to look at. I like that drapery a lot. And that really, I like the way this one has a waist on it. And so I decided to change the drapery here to break it up and to put a, a banded waist on her. And I still haven't finished this lower part. I need to go make a, a trim out a piece of wood to produce this flare and this step. And that should take care of a lot of this gap in here. Um, and then I'll rework this. I uh, mentioned before I want to keep this a little heavy so this end doesn't break off. I want to add some mass here because we're going to have to pick this stone up. You got to figure about that when you're thinking of it, when you're when you're creating it, because if you create really weak detail, it won't work. So I uh, straightened her head up to where her head's not leaned out like it was. It still justifies with the top, and it's very close on the front here. Um, I haven't dropped a straight edge for uh, it's here somewhere, but um, it's a. Uh, Straighten her up a little bit. It may end up webbing or almost webbing her head to that wing. Um, but the hard part of this whole composition is making that arm the right length and top of that die with a small flower. That's the, the challenge. Uh, I've seen multiple projects done in this composition with one arm reaching out to um, an accessory like this this die is serving to be the accessory um, and it it didn't end well let's just put it that way I want mine to end well I want mine to um, to do right and this is part of why I'm including this as a, as a lesson um, you've got to learn what to carve in what order to carve it in so that you can succeed because what happened with those other projects see how this looks if this is going to be a see she's back just a little bit her knees still right up near the top she's still got good volume up here but she's uh, I've been able to thin her just a little bit and help keep her height. I want her to be at least seven and a half heads tall. Can shrink her head a tiny bit when I'm when I'm modeling it for the portrait bust. Uh, but I have to be careful because if I make her head small, it's going to make her neck long. Been there, done that, seen that happen too. Uh, somebody had to fix a statue one time that was, I think it was six foot tall, and it had a head like a watermelon. Well, they wanted a six foot tall statue, so they got a six foot tall statue. When they're done, it looked like one of them elephant women with all the rings around their neck and their necks, you know, twice as long as it should be. So, but, um, and it isn't critical that I make her face perfect in terms of the job, but in terms of presenting it to the customer, the patron, if you show them a picture of a model before it's presentable and say, I'm going to fix this, they're not going to hear that. They want to see what's beautiful, and if they see her looking like, you know, she ain't pretty enough, they're apt to blow up. And uh, I had that with the floral project last year, and they were wanting to know about it and wanting to see it, and I said, well, I haven't done the flowers yet. I said, oh, it's okay, send the picture, and the woman blew up. She says, those flowers are awful. I'm like, I hadn't even made petals yet. They're not flowers. But we got to make this arm work. One of the ways to do that is that when I cut this stone, we're going to do the bulk of all of this first. We're going to get this and this, all this put together, and this is still going to be heavy. So that if this arm needs to come up, maybe the top of this die, because I made a mistake, even though I'm measuring carefully to make sure this is the same length as this, and this is the same length as this, and they're both a head long, all that other stuff, if I have to move this die up or down, the top, a quarter inch or a half inch, 
to make it justify, to make this arm look like it's the right size arm. It's not too big and it's not too small. I can do that. And that's the kind of lesson you learn from watching other people succeed and fail because they went ahead and did other details. One job was because that was the order you needed to cut it in and they could have cut it a little more different, accurate placement. The other one was because they wanted to go ahead and do that because there was fancy detail on it. And it taught me what not to do. So I'm gonna try not to do it, but I'll keep working. The clay's pretty close. Do some more detail on the wings. The wings don't have to be perfect, um, but I wanna get the placement pretty well. And uh, she's looking a lot better than she was. And uh, then I've got a good model to go by for the, uh, the bust for the head and hopefully have that stone in here pretty quick and we get this cast, start cutting stone. I wanna show you something. It's really important when you're modeling the face, when you're modeling detail, remember what we're doing with stone means all we have is the surface shape or profile or landscape, whatever you want to call it, to create everything. We're not using color. We're not painting it. We're not putting a patina on there like you do with brass. And we're not going to do any gimmicks like that. We have to have an actual surface that is contoured properly so that it looks like there's muscle, like, like, it's, a, like it's real. We also have to understand that in harsh light, a lot of that detail will disappear. Now, let me see if I can turn this light on and this will work. Okay, see how that wipes her out? And you can see a lot of the detail isn't there. And the shiny, the way this clay looks, the stone isn't going to look just like that. It's going to be somewhat similar. It'll have some sparkle and reflection but it won't bounce light like this. It's gonna be rough, it's gonna be a different texture. One of the things people don't understand about plaster is that plaster is gonna be as smooth as the clay in general, you know, depending on your mold. And that's not what you're gonna carve, and, and if you do a bronze, that's exactly what it's gonna be like. And that's why they have to go ahead and make sure that with bronze, they may put a patina and darken in areas that are supposed to be shadowed so that it'll always be shadow because it's gonna be a smooth metallic surface that's gonna have this reflection like this one does. It's not gonna be like stone. When I do stone, when I carve this, these are all gonna be hand axed. If you do it with a die grinder, it's gonna be all faceted. Now you can do that, you know, whether you do it with, um, and if you do marble, you know, you can polish it, whether you polish it mechanically or with acid or whatever. Um, and then you've got a shine to deal with that won't last if it's outside. But see, by turning it off, you can see how there's actual shape and contour that creates a lot of the, the, the volume and the anatomical structure that you want. And so you've got to work with it. And by using, by having a, a dark studio that's um, where I control the light, I can model her and get her very close to what I want. I can turn the light on and I can notice things that may not be obvious otherwise, whether it's an unevenness in, in, in a plane or, you know, if, if there's a contour that should be shaped differently and I can work with those and try to get it to where it's very well balanced one side to the other. And then when you turn the light off, you can read it much differently. So clay will help you understand volume. And when you get down to doing work at a certain level where it's got to be really, really great, that tiny amount of volume will change her from looking vibrant and beautiful to looking like she forgot to put her dentures in. Those character lines you carve on her face intentionally on the stone will end up making her look like she's much older than you want her to be. If you put lines under her eyes, it'll look like bags under her eyes. But when you ax it with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the chisel, when you're scraping it, you can scrape those lines and you can scrape the same way that you swept this and you can create a lot of the same contour and detail just by your, what would be in painting, your penmanship with your chisel. 
And that's something that by smoothing it so much, you take away that detail. And you got to avoid doing that if you're going to do granite and learn how to use the chisel and all those strokes. Because all of this drapery, these lines, most of the lines will be vertical. They'll be axed. And I may put some lines across to create a roughness and a texture of fabric. But I want these lines to go up and down to follow these curves. You know, and, and maybe with a with a do a cove in here so that it actually looks and it will it will further enhance the shape that you perceive with your eyes. So I think we're gonna go ahead and leave it there, make this video done. Um, it's hard to explain how much there is that needs to happen all at the same time. Um, so I appreciate you hanging in there and, and studying this. Um, I've got some real nice direct comments about the videos, uh, people happy with them. And I hope it's helping, you know, if it's helping one or two people, that's the whole point. Um, I know most people aren't going to go to this level, uh, or try to do work in stone. You know, this will all translate, you know, what I'm telling you, except for the actual putting a chisel on granite. This is carving stone. You can carve wood, you can carve anything, but this is carving and this is sculpture work. Um, you can apply this to your piece of soap stone or African wonder stone or Carrara marble or Yule marble or whatever you've got. You don't have to do it in granite. Um, but I, I can't emphasize enough how much benefit you will gain from practicing in clay practicing in a plastic media, whether it's clay or wax or whatever you've got, and studying work. You, you're going to have to practice. You're going to have to study. This doesn't just, you know, the, the old adage that somebody's a photographer and, and they take beautiful pictures and everybody says, wow, you must have a really good camera. Okay, dude, it ain't the camera that, that makes the magic. The camera's a tool that has to be used properly. And the photographer has to understand everything about exposing and lighter and composition of, of, of subject and, and, and everything. And I don't understand that stuff. I'm not a photographer. So, um, but studying stone, I'm studying clay, studying sculpture. And you've got, to, you've got to put in the effort. It takes a long time to do it. This isn't something, you know, one of the guys, somebody stopped one time, they're going to carve stone. He, he was retired and and he could afford to do what he wanted to do and he'd been there done it and tried some different stuff and he finally says he says this is really expensive this is really you can't really just do this as a hobby you really have to invest it it takes a long time to get good at this even if you do have enough equipment and material and he was right so hang in there and keep practicing and uh, I'm anxious to get her wrapped up so we can start running, running plaster and get this plaster done so that um, we can put it together. But I want to get the, the clay wrapped up. I want to understand better um, to make sure that I've got her in the right balance and the right dimensions so that when I do her in stone, she really looks good. And because uh, uh, I'm doing it in front of y'all, this is going to magically have a second piece of granite pop up and get carved. She's either going to look good or she's going to look the way she looks. And uh, that's why I'm trying to show y'all. Um, this isn't just some camera trick or academia or I can, I can make this one disappear. This is paying Bill's work and I got to do a good job. And I want to show you this is where the rubber meets the road. So... Um, we'll wrap this video up. My name is Clint Button. I'm a grant sculptor here at Carolina Sculpture Studio with the virtual stone carving apprenticeship. Thanks for coming in.